Hello viewers, I have a guest in the studio. His name is Yadis Azogye Boja. He is known prominently by his contribution to Africa Union. He is an artist, a musician, a father, and he is back from the States and now in Ethiopia. I've got a chance to sit with him. Thank you very much for joining us, Yadisa. Thank you for inviting me. I'm having a good time. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we've been looking for this interview for long, but uh, we couldn't have a chance to meet you. Yeah, it's a long time coming. I was trying to come and sit with you for a long time, so this is very special for me. And um, I really like the OBN studio and what you guys did here. It's mm -hmm. impressive. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So you come to attend the meeting of African Union, Head of States. They invited you to join them. And how is the meeting? How, what, what do you observe from that particular meeting in terms of progress in Africa? Well, um, the last time I was an African Union, it was 2010. I think I saw uh, a brand new building, shining building, and a more bigger African Union. Um, the leaders seem very um, friendly and very in sync with each other. Uh, and last time I came, it was um, the leader was uh, Colonel Gaddafi, and there was a little bit of friction at the time. I remember when he lost uh, the presidency, he was not happy about all mm -hmm. of these things. But this time, the the presidents are young, like our uh, uh, Dr. Abi. Prime Minister. And yes, and um, they are more energetic, more um, easygoing, and understand each other and uh, friendly. Mm -hmm. So. I saw a better African Union from the last time. Okay, your connection with African Union started with your, the flag you made for African Union. And the international announcement was made and then you prepared that flag for them. They, fortunately, your flag was chosen for, to be a flag of African Union. How was that process and what was the impression when you hear that yours is chosen? Well, um, the process was, uh, took pretty much three years. Um, I designed the, 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 what I expect is going to be African Union flag and send it. Uh, the whole process took three years for them to choose. And then finally they gave back to me. And when I heard about it, I was very impressed and proud. But the effect of um, what it meant sinked in after a long time when I see people on the street thanking me. And when I see soldiers died and being wrapped with the flag, and when I see it, you know, standing behind President Obama and these world of great people, uh, it just starts sinking in later on. But um, at first, it was a shock. So I was mm -hmm. like, oh my God, I can't, I'm, 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 I did an African Union flag. But I didn't know what it meant. So it was great. So, what's your inspiration to that particular flag? And what, what, th what does the details in that flag? communicate to Africans and how far have you communicated your thinking through that flag? Well, um, the, um, the whole idea for me was what Africa, what I expect of Africa to be in the next 150 years. Um, coming from the past 15 years where most African countries are um, dealt with colonization and the struggle to be free from them. The feeling of organization for African Union was about winning their, getting their stand. But this one is a new dawn, a new start for Africa. That's why I have more hopeful feeling and more what I expect in Africa to be. And so judging from what I saw in the past 10 years, I think we're heading to the right direction. Um, seeing a young, energetic, and smart presidents like Prime Minister Abiy um, give me a lot of hope. And I see um, African leaders talking about borderless continent, more connection in business, uh, security. And uh, there are a lot of problems in Africa, but um, we are making, uh, you know, I think they start baby steps to, to get into the larger, better Africa. So you've been keeping touch from far, uh, what's going on in Africa. Uh, I, I know that you have an up-to-date up information about Ethiopia and Africa. So how far Africa went in terms of your vision to Africa? And do you think that what you thought of Africa can be achieved in a very short period of time? Uh, achieving the goal in a very short period of time can be very difficult for Africa because 
what happened in Africa took almost a century, you know, you know, from colonization to, to what we have today. But the process seems like sort of distorted. And African countries are being more smarter about their manpower, their resources. Um, so the process is started, but it takes, it's not going to be uh, an easy step. It takes a lot of dedication, and mostly African citizens have to step up and being the part of this great adventure. Um, I think we can accomplish it if we feel like we're our brothers and sisters keeper, and if we feel like we have to care for each other, we can achieve a lot. But most of African problem comes because of war and displacement and lack of um, green resources. People who fled to other countries. If we really dealt with those things, I think Africa will have a better future. You know, so when I, again, when I go back to um, the new, the new group of new presidents, I see them talking the right talk, and I hope they follow up and you know walk the light walk too and do the right thing. And I'm I'm hopeful. Mm -hmm. From your perspective, what major challenges do you observe that can hinder the development and could be social and economic development in Africa? Well, I have to say the the biggest problem in Africa is the lack of democracy, and the lack of democracy will turn into displacement, people leaving. Africans are losing most of the manpower, knowledge power. Brain drain did not happen if Africa would not, was more democratic and for a, a citizen. Like for example, if you take Ethiopia, um, if you go to um, biggest firms in the United States where I came from, you see people filled, Ethiopian, like my city for example, Boeing, there is a lot of engineers from Ethiopia. Microsoft, a lot of engineers. Um, you know, computer experts in Starbucks, and I work for University of Washington. There is a lot of brain drain, but the country is losing, and we all grew up in our country, but end up working for other countries. So the biggest problem is the people are not the problem because they fled because of the lack of democracy. I fled my country. Um, you know, if the democracy was great, I'd probably be here. And um, I'm not saying what I did is right, but what I'm saying is I can see the effect of it. Mm -hmm. So we're still losing manpower, we're still losing power, and, and, uh, uh, people who are well educated, they can contribute to their country. So once we build, the democracy has to be built and the p Africa has to be the safe haven for our, our citizens. So that would be the start. Mm -hmm. um, that is be the biggest challenge African countries have. So we have to work on that. And also we have to work in creating jobs and using our resources ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about uh, flooding one's country, number of diasporas are, I mean, huge number of diasporas are living abroad, including the United States where you live in. And what, what do you suggest diasporas can play a role in taking part in development of their own country? What do you expect from this? Uh, as a diaspora, what do you think you should play, I mean, in the coming years ahead? Well. The, f the first thing that diasporas have to do is being uh, in sync and they need to pay attention to what's happening here. Um, the second thing is diasporas also have to know that there is no easy way anywhere. You know, for example, if you live in, in America, you deal with a lot of um, racism, sometimes you deal with a lot of um, um, bad things. So even if they come back to their country, if they, and nothing can be as smooth as all the time. So we need to face that challenge and um, be a part of this new um, Ethiopia, for example. I cannot give advice on that because I'm still living in the in, in United States. So I can't be a role model or an example on that. But I see there are a lot of people who came back and accomplished a lot. And there's a lot of people who came here and did great. But at the same time, I see a lot of people who came back and discouraged and went back. So um, the local government's effort to make things more easily accessible to diasporas that need, need to be here, they have to do that. And also diasporas also understand they have to have a patience and uh, live their life like the natives here who, li who lived here, but don't expect any handouts or, or you know, special access. So it's a give and take. It's mm -hmm. Government have to make it really easier for them to move in, to move back. 
and that's for us also have to have understanding that they're not special just because they came from diaspora but they can contribute a lot my point is they should ask what they can do for their country not mm. ask what the country do for them like kennedy said as you said you are observing progress in ethiopia that makes you to feel hopeful about your country so now onwards will you be ready to actively engage in activities in ethiopia uh, will you be here for good or are you going to back to the states what is your plan I am right now I have two kids and they are in the middle of their school they're 11 and 9 um, they they really want to come to Ethiopia and live here if they can but we have to um, I, I, I talked about this when I was here in 2010 moving in is a sa as hard as moving out mm -hmm. like you can you can move out you know go to embassies ask for visas go through all the process hard also moving back is the same thing because you have to put it, your life in, in hold sold things you have moved kids from school that would be challenging my hope is i can contribute to my country uh, regardless of where i am i have to be uh, just like i was in the past 20 some years um, i work in a lot of fundraisings for my country i work with a lot of uh, i work with uh, ethiopia reads and a company called open heart big dreams helps build libraries and things like that so even if i'm out I'm also was in tune with the country. Moving in, I see myself in the future if I have a chance to help my country in whatever way I can, wh whether it's educating or, or teaching or things like that, sharing my experience. Okay, I mean, going back to your workers, you usually say you want to be a voice for the voiceless. So you mainly focus on exposing human rights in Ethiopia and being advocate of human rights. So th this major pieces you produce so far are mainly circulating around that, focus on that main area. Uh, do you think that the work you have done so far made you to achieve what you thought on that regard? Well, I have to say yes. Um, for example, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, I remember when um, Mr. Bakalagerba was in prison, and um, we don't see a whole lot of his faces. Cameras don't catch it, but I used to paint his paintings, and people used to start using that in their protests and things like that. Um, the jail might cover his face, but the artist's brush exposed it. Um, the same thing happened uh, with one dar uh, girl that uh, came to United States because of adoption and the parents mm -hmm. killed her. Mm -hmm. And I remember me painting, and that kind of restart a protest. Finally, the parents was sentenced to jail for 17 years, both of them, husband and wife. But her name is Hannah. Oh, but we used to do music. I used to do music for her. I painted her, uh, her look, dying with the hypothermia and a cold. And that, that basically showed people what she went through, even if I was not there. So. Artists can do things like that. So I, yes, I have to say um, my work for more protest and things like that um, helped show the unseen things, things that's hidden from the society. And since I was living in a free country in the United States, I have a luxury of using my freedom to expose these things um, without afraid of being prosecuted. And there are a lot of great people who lived in here who struggled and did that for the change to happen. Um, but we also, I also use my freedom to exercise that. You have painted uh, portraits for prominent individuals like you stated, Bekele Gerba, Dr. Marera, and uh, Tadeshe Biru, Mandela, and most recently for the Prime Minister, Dr. Abi Ahmed. So you had a chance to meet him when he was visiting the United States of America. Then you gave that portrait personally to him. What was the impression at that time, and what words have you exchanged with him? Well, um, it was an amazing time. I honestly, um, that's another thing that really amazes me, how um, I start painting someone in power. Um, that's how much he convinced me is what he's doing was right. Because for me, I did not expect myself to be 
giving a pending to a sitting prime minister, um, give, going through what we, go, we went through. But his work and his, his speeches and his actions make me believe that we got a prime minister that actually can speak for us, can actually tell us the truth. And so that's why I painted him. And then when I gave it to him, he was, he said, he, he really thankful for it. And then when he, they brought it to here and how they export, like take it out of the plane, the gravitas and the, the respect they gave to the work is really fulfilling. And I'm really grateful for him and to his, um, uh, for, to our first lady and for their kindness and for, you know, for, you know, they make me feel like my work fits them. So I, I'm really happy about that. Like another thing we have to talk about, I think, is there are two distinctive thoughts on the purpose of art. The first one is art could be served for different social purposes. The other thought is art for the artist's sake and the truth as it is. Mm -hmm. In which category you regard yourself? Well, I, I am basically uh, the one who uses art for, um, to express feelings is more where I'm inclined to. You know, a person can draw a beautiful flower and can be in a living room and still an art. And I can draw a, a prisoner and still an art. Their purpose is totally different though. So some choose the beautiful painting and some choose the hard painting. But if your purpose is to expose something, to change people's life, you definitely don't want to paint a beautiful flower. Mm -hmm. Rather, people that go through a struggle. So I, I dedicate my work mostly for the first one where I can use my art to say something rather than just for the sake of art. Okay. What, what do you think is one of the most impactful art pieces you have made so far? Which one do you pick first? Ooh. Well, I, that's a very, that's basically asking like which baby, which son of your baby you like. <laughs> you know, because difficult to it's choose very, from? It's very difficult because okay. um, I, I never did an art um, based on who owned it or who it, the gravitas of the person you know, I'm doing it. Because sometimes you do a sketch and it have more effect in a very short time. And sometimes, you know, I, l let, me, let me put it this way. I like the paintings that exposed human rights violation more than any other paintings. And for example, that Bagada painting would be one of them. The Bagalagarbas painting is another one. I did um, Professor Mara when he was in prison. That was very powerful in the social media. I did Sena Solomon when she was in prison and um, I did a live painting with her singing and I remember people are talking about who is she and they start talking about her. Um, so my arts are used to remem remind people who the, the low locked in the dark. Mm -hmm. So shining that light based on your brush is the most powerful thing you can do as an artist. So I prefer those kind of paintings. you're engaging yourself in is music so you are doing reggae music mostly so why do you prefer reggae why not other type of music well reggae is a voice for the voiceless it's a it's a, it's a, it's a song of disc uh, people who are discriminated you know even if you see when Bomali is singing sees he talks about africans unite norman no cry uh, concrete jungle all of these are talking about people who nobody talked about and they are showing the white supremacy in their music. So for me, it fits my, mu my, my art sty like style. And I speak for voiceless, so here it goes. Reggae is a voice for voiceless, so it, it, it fits. Um, and I, as you already know, I'm not singing mostly to, um, just for the sake of singing, but I sing it because I want people to think about something. If you listen to, for example, Recha, 
the music in Recha is trying to rem remind people what that young girl went through when she came to Recha. So if I put you in there, and if you felt that pain yourself, I'm successful already. Um, so that's what I'm, the, I chose the reggae part. So can we say that uh, reggae the most, the most preferable way of conveying your message to your audience? Yes. I have to say that simply because um, reggae have a rhythm that easily communicable to a world we're listening with. So I am basically more, more successful when I use reggae than other music styles. Okay, how do you balance between music and paintings, like portraits? Oh, I see them both as the same kind of art, tell you the truth. For me, sometimes I even write a song while I'm painting. I never, never confuse me, like, because for me, they're both art. I ha people ask me how can I do both of them, but basically for me, um, they have the same purpose. They're both art form of art mm -hmm. to express something so i i can do that but um the more important the more appropriate question for me is when do i get a time to do this <laughs> 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 because yeah. i have two kids and um okay. usually it's because of my wife's help and she never get a credit for it uh, my wife is always there and helping me every time in you know in whatever way I, she can so i have to just say thank you to her <laughs> okay, I hope an artist by profession, you graduated. But first, the most amazing part for me is you graduated in accounting from Commerce College. Yes. Your first professional experience, but uh, you left that, then you joined art school yeah. in the United States. Your first uh, is graphic design illustration from Seattle Design Academy and then BA degree from Seattle Pacific University mm -hmm. in 2005. How do you shift from being an accountant to an artist? Well, that's an interesting story because I was not um, attended accounting by design. They basically tell me to go to accounting even if I don't want to be an accountant. And um, that would be a helpful thing for the Japan ministry office to, to see because I was not cut out to be an, an accountant, so I never have an interest in doing it. So when I graduated and get um, art, I will drop it quickly because I'm not interested in it. But account, uh, you know, I basically can do things for free for an art as an artist because I love it that much. So the the the, the learn the learning from it is, young people have to follow their dreams, and do what they like rather than being told by society which way they have to go. Basically. So what about doing art, I mean, professionally like you, and doing art only by passion or without having a skill and knowledge? How, how do you compare between the effectiveness of both ways? Well, they both, like, for example, you see a lot of Ethiopian artists who are accomplished a lot, but they don't have education background. What the education do for you in the art is tells you how to manage your art and how to reach more uh, audiences, how to craft your work. The art is an art. I can do it, or a woman that do a Jebana art still is an art. But the difference is there is a purpose for an artist where we study an art. So if there are a lot of artists out there who are doing art, um, I would encourage them to go to school and learn it because it will be a plus on what they already have. But art is an art, regardless of who did it. The cave art was the first art. Mm -hmm. So n they didn't graduate. People from Stone Age used to do art, still an art. But what makes them difference is how successful they can be with it, with a tool. That's why you have to go to school and add on that. So if you're an artist doing it by just out of, uh, out of interest, you can make it a better art by going to school, but it doesn't make you a lesser artist. Okay, let's uh, talk about the awards you have achieved so far. The first one, as we talked about earlier, is Africa Union flag, be being chosen by an African Union. Mm -hmm. And the second one is uh, VO Radio for Excellence in Artists, uh, featuring UWIC. 
and other awards are also there. Which award impresses you most? Well, um, the African Union is a huge accomplishment, really. The rest of them are just focusing on your success, and they will, they will basically acknowledging that you have a good work. But the African Union is actually chosen by 53 head of states. And when you really think about it and the world leaders sitting there and choosing your work, it is quite an accomplishment and something to be proud of. And also since a lot of people are represented with, with 1.2 billion people are represented by this flag, I don't think I can ever match the African Union with anything else. You have worked at the University of Washington, Housing and Food Service, 2016 to present, it says, and also uh, different working ex experience are there. What do you do now? I work for the University of Washington, not in D.C., but in the state of Washington. What do you Seattle. do there? And I'm a graphic designer. Basically, um, what we do is branding and designing, and it can be print or web. So I work in different mediums. I've been working there for 14 years. That's usually uh, what we call commercial art because we focus on doing brandings for different um, different projects and different uh, businesses. It can be a cafe, it can be anything else. I use those times uh, that, as a full-time employee. That's how I gain my living. That's how I raise my family, I contribute to my family. But my other time is my fine art, which is Commercial art is usually is very limited. You have to do what the business asks. Mm -hmm. For me to vent, I have to use my fine art so I can do whatever, so nobody can tell me anything to do. So it is my, my way of yin and yang, and uh, my way of uh, um, balancing that artistic juice in my mind. So you had a chance to display some of your work in the United States. I mean, sometimes representing your country and sometimes individually. What does that mean for you when it comes to serving your country? Well, wherever I went, people, you know, call me Ethiopian American artist, right? So they see something, uh, they ask me about my country everywhere I go when I do art show. So whenever you put some light about your country through those kind of works, it's always a plus. People want to know who you are, know what, you know what the country is about. And then they will go home and Google it and learn about it, start eating Ethiopian food, you know, then end up traveling here. So it's not just me, when whoever uh, were outside and other countries, when we do something you know, that's good, it benefits the country. So that's what I'm trying to do. That's why I mostly use my talent and my energy to create, is to bring some positive light to the country. If you go to uh, Western countries, you will see Ethiopia have a really bad brand for the past 30, 40 years. Whenever you talk about Ethiopia, people ask you about drought, about war, things like that. So for the first time, we start seeing that changing because people like me and, um, who are went over there, we're talking about um, uh, millions of people who displace the country, mm -hmm. start bringing new light to the country. Now, when people go to the neighborhoods and eat Ethiopian food and go to uh, co community center and meet Oromo community center or Tigray community center, wherever, and then start seeing those things, they start bringing, oh my God, I need to know more about this country. Mm -hmm. So the, da the diasporas have benefited for being there and, and bringing a positive light in what is consider the bad light in Japan. You said you're, you're a father, you're dealing with the family, you work art workers, and you engage in different life activities. How do you manage to do that? Well, the first, I think, um, usually, you know, I'm, I'm the artist in the, f in the family, so I, I talk to media, and I get most of the credit, but my wife um, make most of it happen for me because she was doing all these things that I'm not doing. And sh I have to give her the props for that because she's helping me. And the community is also helping me. But the other, the other part is, it's a choice. It's a, the choice is if you really want to be a voice for a voice, that it takes time, mm -hmm. it takes energy, it takes um, dedication. But I believe in it that much, so I would do it. Okay, do you have someone, an artist, someone who inspired you? 
to be an artist like you? I mean, someone you, you name as an example. Well, my inspiration started when I was a little kid. My brother used to do art in my home, so that's where I started learning. But once I grow up and start doing art, there are a lot of artists that kind of gave me an idea. For example, one of them is Jack, Jacob Lawrence. He's an African-American artist, and his work is really great. Um, he uses dark, bold faces and talks about a lot of racism and Jim Crow and things like that. And that opened my eyes. I also have other artists like uh, Georgia O'Keeffe uh, who uh, are a feminine at the time and, and used her work to show her things, uh, her to, to speak about women's rights and things like that. So um, I, every one of us lean on other people. So I, um, I learn a lot from those uh, uh, mostly African-American artists because they went through somehow the same kind of struggle that I went through in finding their identity and um, finding hegemony and control of one over another. Mm -hmm. So I would say Jacob Lawrence is my, my hero. Okay. So you have already built a global connection through your work. So do you have a plan to share experiences you had in it so far? And do you have like planning to link your network from the States to Ethiopia so that youngsters will be benefited from your experience in the scheme? Yes, my hope is to do that. But um, I think I need help from uh, local government uh, to arrange some of it for me. Like for example, uh, if it's not easy for, for me to come and do an art show, but if I have someone who here interested about doing art show with me, I can do better work. Mm -hmm. um, an artist need to have a system around it. And this is not just for me, but for anyone who lives in here, artists need a support so they can actually do their work. But artists are not great in organizing things. They like, they're great in creating things, and I'm one of them. I can do art, I can do day and night art, but I'm not really good in arranging travels and things like that. So if I get help like that, I'd be happy to do a show um, and come here and give training and classes to uh, people who are interested in that. Uh, from what I observed from your, what you've done so far, you, uh, you don't limit yourself in what you do. And you focus and advocate human rights abuses wherever it is. And from where you live in, in the United States, you mostly do work on black Americans' rights and you advocate for the right of black Americans in there, African Americans. Okay, yeah. So how, how do you focus on that? Uh, do you have personal experience on that or is that because you observe some abuses in where you live in? Well, that's a very good question because um, first of all, we are, um, the African Americans live through a whole lot of um, problems, but the, the, the rights and the privileges that we're sharing in the United States right now, we're enjoying, is paid by the sacrifice of African American people. So we owe them a big debt and being the, an ally in their communities. Because if you really think about uh, civil rights and uh, the rights that we have in the United States right now, it's paid by the blood uh, of people like Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, and all of these people who struggled for, for those rights. So for me, it's not even a matter of choice, it's a matter of responsibility that I stand in alignment with African American community. Second, African American communities knew most of the hegemonic and white supremacist way of doing things in, in, in there. And I can identify with them because even if I am not, um, my ancestors are not enslaved like they are, or if then even if they, I went, I did not went through the problem they went to, I can still share some experience with them because we still deal with a system that's huge in white supremacy. So we are allies and we share the same experience. So that's why I'm more aligned with that. In connection with this, you had a chance to meet with uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson yes. in 2014. He's a prominent human rights activist in the United States of America and once a president candidate in the, that country. 
So what, what have you talked with him and what experience has he told you? Can you tell me on that? Well, um, there is no, in my mind, there is no Obama if there is no Jesse Jackson. And there is no Jesse Jackson if there is no Charlie Chisholm and other, um, you know, African Americans who actually broke the ceiling, like the, they, they, they broke out and, and accomplished something. So Jesse Jackson actually um, did a lot of groundwork so that lived for Obama. Even if Obama is uh, end up being a president, mm -hmm. um, the work started with Jesse Jackson. He's a civil rights movement. He's a uh, leader. He struggled for the rights for Af African American and, and people like me in there. So meeting him was an honor for me. And also he was very gracious and very nice. And he talked very elegantly about uh, what we need to do as a black person to face and to find our own voice in big organization. At the time, he was talking about corporate world and how we can find um, your voice in the corporate world. So yes, the uh, experience of meeting him was an honor and I'm really happy and I, I'm, I'm wishing him a long, prosperous life. Okay, being, uh, witnessing the first African-American president in the United States in 2008 was uh, one of the big news in the world. So you were there and even campaigning for his presidency, I think, because most of African-Americans were campaigning for him. Uh, what does that mean for African-American and what have been changed since he, he became president of the United States? A lot changed, a lot changed because the gain is not just by passing some laws or, uh, you know, assigning Supreme Court judges. The gain is showing our kids that it is possible to be a black person and to be a pa president of the most powerful world in the, uh, country in the world. Once that is shown to stu the kids, anything is possible. So what did Obama for us is he showed that, that if we believe in ourselves and struck and did the right thing, anything is possible. I think that's the biggest accomplishment for us. Okay, Adisa, finally, what's your plan for your country? I mean, the coming years, do you have anything to do? I mean, to support the youth or personally to contribute by your work? Well, my, I, my, my dream is to continue to help people who don't have um, like and fundraising and things like that. Um, and also trying to share my experience as an artist. If I get an opportunity to present my work and talk to students, I will take it graciously. And, and I have a, a bigger prayer and hope that we live in peace and, and we are a brother's house, sister's keeper. And what's your wish for Ethiopia? I wish a success to my country and I want peace. And um, I want a very open and transparent election. And may we all you know, live together in peace and harmony. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, by the way, thank you for your, this great design. And you contributed a lot. And in front of the audience, I'm very grateful for what you've done for us. Yeah, well, the, the design is made by me, but my sister, uh, you design, she helped us do this. And um, this can be done. Anybody who are uh, young, a woman, who can open small industry of uh, can do things like this. And we look really good, and thanks to her, too. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's uh, great, I mean, having you on our show. I hope we'll be meeting once again when you come back from the States. I can't wait. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Have a good time. You too. Thank, thank you. you.